Please rise. Once again, we hear uh, some of the words from our gospel reading from today, Luke chapter 6. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. When Jesus preaches and teaches, it's almost always quite impressive. In fact, on one occasion it was said of him, never did a man speak like this. Never. And so when Jesus spoke, it was in one sense original. It was authoritative, and it was usually quite in-depth. Now, our text for this morning is what you would call law preaching, just pure and simple law preaching, the commands of God. But what Jesus does here, and he does this to some degree in this whole Sermon on the Mount, which is where our text is from, Jesus takes the skeleton outline, you might say, of the Ten Commandments and puts flesh on them. He allows us to understand a, a deeper meaning of the commandments. Jesus gives us four commands here. Don't judge, don't condemn, forgive, and give. So we're going to look at these one at a time and look at them in a little detail. So the first one, don't judge. Now before we explain what this means, we have to explain what it does not mean. And the reason we have to explain what it does not mean is because many people today are taking this command of Jesus, don't judge, and changing it, twisting it, so it doesn't mean what Jesus actually means it to mean. And you can be sure also of this, whenever the word of God or the word of Christ is taken and twisted, changed from what it means to what it doesn't mean, you always find behind this <coughs> Satan himself. This is the way Satan has always worked throughout the centuries, beginning in the Garden of Eden. Taking the word of God and twisting it, changing its meaning. And we also know Satan's intention. It's always the same. Whenever Satan takes the word and twists it and changes it, he's always seeking to do one of two things either to prevent people from coming to Christ, receiving Christ by faith, or coming to Christians and snatching from them their faith in Christ. This is what Satan is always up to. And this is the way he always works. Now, we have a very good example of this twisting from last Sunday, what happened in Orlando, where a Muslim terrorist killed 50 people, wounded 53 others in a GLBT nightclub. It was um, horrible. It was 
immoral, it was inexcusable. And we have been told that this horrible, immoral, inexcusable crime against this GLBT community is caused by hate. Hatred of the GLBT lifestyle. And that such hatred of this lifestyle is the result of a lack of love and respect and tolerance of the GLBT lifestyle. And we're also told that this disrespect and intolerance of the lifestyle is caused by judging. People judging that such lifestyles are sinful. And then they point us to what Jesus says here. Do not judge. In other words, you're saying this command of Jesus means do not judge that their lifestyle or the lifestyle of anybody or the beliefs of anybody are wrong or sinful. But this is not what Jesus means when he says, don't judge. Look at it this way. Just to see how crazy this is. If you found out that your neighbor, very good neighbor, was a thief and that he practiced stealing, would you say, oh, the, but the commandment of Jesus says, don't judge that what he is doing is, is wrong, is sinful. You wouldn't do that. Or let's suppose you found out your neighbor was unfaithful to his wife, he was committing adultery. Very good neighbor, always helpful, but his lifestyle consisted of adultery. Would you then say, oh, but Jesus said, don't judge that, that what that man is doing is sinful. Okay? Or let's suppose uh, you found out your neighbor was Hindu. And you said to yourself, or an uh, idolater, okay? And, and you said to yourself, but Jesus said, don't judge. So I can't judge or say that that man's worship, his religion is wrong or off base. You would never say that. But this is what is, what is happening today with this one area where we're told to take this command of Jesus and apply it in a way that it is never intended to be applied. The other thing I'll point out to you is, is, is something very interesting as well too. You know, we say that if, people tell us that if, if we, we judge something to be sinful like this lifestyle, GLBT or whatever it might be, that we therefore do not love them. And of course, there are going to be cases where we don't, okay? And that's wrong. But it's not because we've agreed with the word of God that this is sinful. In fact, we can only truly love such people, whether it be the gay person or the idolater or the thief or the adulterer. We can only truly love them if we understand that what they're doing is sinful. Because if we don't acknowledge sin is sin, like so many churches are prone to do these days, then we cannot tell a person, hey, your belief, your lifestyle is wrong, it's sinful. You need to examine this. You need to turn, you need to repent. And here's Jesus for you. But this is the world in which we live, where this 
command of Jesus is, is twisted. And it's very unfortunate. But let's talk now about what this command of Jesus does mean. What does it mean not to judge? Well, it means that we are not to look at another person and find in them sinful activities when those activities don't exist. We are not to look at other people and think, oh, I know what they're thinking. I, what, I know what their motives are. I can read their heart. No. That is the wrong and sinful kind of judging. But above all, the sinful kind of judging means saying, they do that, I don't. And therefore, I am better. And this is what comes out in the last part of our gospel text today when Jesus says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? And so the wrong and the sinful kind of judging always includes they do that and I don't. He's an adulterer, I'm not. He's gay, I'm not. I, I go to church, he doesn't. I worship the true God, he doesn't. Therefore, look at me, I'm better. Now the problem, of course, is that whether you're talking about the idolater, the adulterer, the sexually immoral, the thief, or whatever, or every one of us here, we all have within us that same source from which all sins flow. And just because you and I don't commit this sin, this sin, or that sin, we have that same sinful nature from which flows this sin, this sin, and this sin. As I've said before, we're all in the same boat. We're all by nature sinful and unclean. And so again, don't judge means essentially you're not supposed to put yourself above others. All right, the second command is very similar. Don't condemn. This one is maybe, you might say, taking the judging a step further and pronouncing a sentence on the other person and saying something like, well, this happened to that group. Uh, they deserved it. Or even just thinking, okay, on the last day, they're going to go to hell, and I'm not. So it's just acknowledging that whatever evil or bad happens to a person or to a group is well-deserved. But I don't deserve it. And when you look at scripture, it's very clear. And Jesus talks about this himself. He says, when, when some atrocity happens out there, the finger isn't to be pointed at them and say, oh, look how terrible they were. But Jesus says you're going to use that very sad situation to point back to ourselves as a reminder that we need to live in repentance day by day and go to the grace of God in Christ day by day. The next command forgive. I believe this is much easier said than done. We sometimes hear, and maybe we even sometimes say something like, well, I will forgive him, but that doesn't mean I have to love him. You've heard that before? Yes, it does. You do have to love your brother. In fact, you cannot separate love and forgiveness. They go together. Imagine if God said this to us. I will forgive you, but that doesn't mean I'm going to love you. We'd be shaken in our boots if he approached us in that way. So when we forgive somebody, we forgive them unconditionally, just as we've been forgiven. And that means we're not going to have anger towards that person anymore. 
We're not going to hold a grudge against them. We're not going to be irritated. We're not going to be resentful. We're not going to reproach them. We're not going to ignore them. We're not going to give them the cold shoulder. When we forgive, we love as well. And that's why Jesus said early in this, earlier in the same chapter, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. And, uh, you know, this, this command to forgive, it, it doesn't come easy. We may think it comes easy, but it's not. It's, it's very, very difficult. I remember when I was at Bethany College and I had hired somebody to be the, the dorm mother, as we called her back then, the resident manager. And uh, this was a younger lady, and she was the most wonderful Christian lady I've ever known. And she didn't have a hateful bone in her body until one day <laughs> one of the students doused her with a bucket of water. And... and uh, I don't remember all the details, but I do remember her reaction. I mean, you should have seen what I would call the hate in her eyes towards this person. I said, whoa, where did this come from? Well, again, the same source that we all share in common. It's, it's there. All right, the last command. Give. And we can quote Christ all over the place here. For example, no man has greater love than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. He give up his life for his friends. We are not here on earth to serve ourselves. We are here on earth to serve others and to give to others. Whether that be helping them, giving them to them financially, showing mercy, contributing to their needs in one way or another, sharing the message of Christ with them, listening to them, giving honor to them, raising our children as we ought to, spoiling our grandchildren, visiting our ailing neighbor next door, feeding the poor, supporting those who are doing something that might be very wrong, and helping them not to do it. So we are to, to give. This is why we are left here on earth, so that we might give and serve and help and, and love our neighbor. And if we benefit from that in the process, we're, we're doubly blessed, and many times we can be, but many times we may have to suffer as well, too. Okay, so you have these four commands. Don't judge, don't condemn, forgive, and give. And how far are we to go with these commands? Well, Jesus puts it this way in our text. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Uh, this is a reference to something that is done with food. And I'm not a cook, so I don't quite relate to it. But here's an example that I can relate to and all of us can relate to, I think. And I'm going to refer to Minnesota. You know, in Minnesota, we have the fall where all the leaves fall down and you have to rake them up. And I'm kind of confused by San Antonio. I think you have maybe two seasons where the leaves come down, at least two seasons. So, and it's very frustrating to me where we only had one season up in Minnesota. But anyway, you take the leaves and uh, we put them in a big plastic bag, right? You fill it up. Is it full? No. You press it down, you shake it, and then you fill it up again. Full? Nope. You can do the same thing. Press it down. I would do this probably four times with one bag. And, and then maybe it was full. And then when you open up the bag, it would just kind of burst open when you would dump them elsewhere. And that's what Jesus is saying here when it comes to how far we go with, how far we are supposed to go with these commands. Put as much into it as you can. And when you think that you've done all that you could do, there's always more to put into it. We can always do a better job of not judging. We can always do a better job of not condemning. We can always do a better job of forgiving. 
we can always do a better job of giving. And so Jesus is setting the bar very, very high. And sometimes when we look at the commands of God, we get excited and say, yes, I'll do it. But our optimism disappears awfully quickly, very often, when we hear these commands of Jesus, and especially when he puts flesh on these, these bones and explains to us the deeper meaning of these commands. It's quite convicting. And so I, I need you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say now. This is very important. Who is Jesus describing here? I would say nobody I know, not me, probably not you, maybe one of us down the road after we've worked at it for a while, I don't think so. But Jesus is describing somebody here. He says, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus is ultimately describing his Father and himself. God put everything he could into it when it came to his mercy. God the Father gave his only begotten son. And even though Jesus, when he came, could have put himself above us, he didn't. He put himself below us and went to the cross. And Jesus could have had himself, or he could have had us condemned for our sins, but he allowed himself to be condemned on the cross with the sentence of death for us. And it is for this reason, and this reason alone, that he forgives all our sins. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. And because he so freely forgives, a forgiveness that we receive by faith alone in Christ, God the Father holds no grudge against us, no bitterness, no resentment, no reproachment, he doesn't ignore us. He doesn't give us the cold shoulder. He forgives freely, unconditionally, completely, for the sake of that condemnation that Christ received. A forgiveness that is received by faith. So he first loved us. But the reason that God gives the way he did, the reason he put himself below us, the reason that he received our condemnation, the reason that we receive complete forgiveness is so that we here in this life might be merciful to others. And so, my brothers and sisters in Christ, by his grace, put into your mercy towards others as much as you can. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.